Good morning. We didn't do a mic check. Are we okay? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, I, I was really, in, I was telling the, the guys, I was really impressed with the <clears throat> audio. So often you go to these events, and, you know, and people are playing with the microphones and can't figure it out. But we're doing a live streaming, and I hope uh, those uh, watching on their computers can hear us as well. So, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it, it's my job. You have, uh, you have the bios of these folks here, but uh, as you're looking to your, uh, to your right from the end of the panel, we have Senator Paul Pinsky from Prince George's County. Uh, three of the members of the panel have gotten promotion. We, this was a high-powered panel to begin with, as Sean uh, said, and uh, three of them have gotten uh, promotions, and, uh, and, and one, unfortunately, got a pink slip. So the, uh, Senator Paul Pinsky from Prince George's County will be the new vice chairman of uh, Education, Health, and, and Environment, Environmental Affairs, I guess it is, but EHE, <clears throat> to those of you familiar with the State House, uh, Senator uh, Rich Maddalino from Montgomery County is the incoming vice chair of the Budget and Taxation Committee. Uh, Delegate Ann Kaiser continu will continue as chair of the Education Subcommittee in uh, Ways and Means, which is the policy area. Uh, for education, and she will be the new majority leader of the House of Delegates. And Delegate John Bohannon has been <clears throat> a longtime expert on education uh, in the House of Delegates, and, uh, and John will not be returning to the House of uh, Delegates, but uh, has as much knowledge on education as... Uh, as almost any member of the House. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start out where the last panel actually left off, if you've been, uh, if you've been watching, and that is uh, funding. And uh, what do you folks see as the prospects for funding for education as, uh, as we head into a a new uh, Republican governor. Senator Pinsky? The, the basic formula, Thornton fu funding, is formula driven, and I don't think any of us expect a, a major change in that. Um, and that actually will be under review over the next couple of years to, to review uh, the adequacy, uh, whether the funding formula is correct. And again, the, the the budget side of education, my colleague in the Senate, uh, Rich Maddalena, has been the expert on that. I've, we've been dealing with the, the policy side. Obviously, there are a number of areas that have already been discussed in the public. School construction, that's a, a big variable, and there are a great deal of needs across the state, uh, and how that's funded uh, is, to a large degree, left to uh, the incoming governor. Um, so school construction, there's been some question about the what was, I hate to call it an add-on to the uh, Thornton Foundation funding for all the schools, the GCEI, the Geographic Cost of Education Index, which helps those uh, urban-suburban uh, systems that have a, a large um, uh, or, or a higher cost of living. It was to assist them, better assist them after the Thornton funding was uh, established. Um, we believe, I think in Prince George's County, and I would assume my colleagues in Montgomery, feel that it should be uh, a given, it's a default, and, and it should be funded uh, as well as the other jurisdictions that are affected by it. Um, if you read the press, some people are adding a question mark about that. Um, we would like to maintain that. We think it should be maintained, and hopefully the needs of the school construction over time can also be uh, addressed. So picking up on what um, Paul had to say, I, I definitely um, fear that the geographic cost of education index is one of those items that could be targeted by the next administration. When you look at the um, amendments that, at least in the Senate, that the Republican caucus has put in over the last few years and their own efforts to, um, to try to cut more from the budget, uh, defunding GCI was always on the list with, um, with uh, Senator Brinkley, who is now on the transition team 
Senator Getty, who is now going to be the governor-elect's chief lobbyist and policy advisor. So um, some of those people who have legislators who have advocated for defunding GCI are, um, are taking or likely to be taking positions with the new administration. So that gives me um, great pause. I would uh, amend one thing that Paul had to say about the GCI. The GCI was part of the Thornton formula. The consultant that came up with the whole approach to Thornton <laughs> Um, back then, Dr. Augenblick, who I believe his firm is still, is again working with the state in the, this next round, Dr. Augenblick recommended GCEI. One of the reasons why it was slightly different than every other piece of the formulas that were implemented in the Bridge to Excellence, which we commonly refer to as Thornton, is it came a little bit later because he said his firm did not have the ability to actually create the index. So he gave us a, um, a rough draft of the index that was put into law for the first two years while the state went out, dealt with another consultant who came back and recommended the actual um, parameters and the variables that are to go into the GCI, um, which unfortunately by that point, Governor Ehrlich decided not to use and would not fund um, the GCI. It was only during the O'Malley administration that um, we were able to, to get that money in and up to 100% funding level. Uh, unfortunately, from my perspective, it's the one piece of, broadly speaking, the operating aid that goes out to the school systems that is not specifically mandated in law. And so the governor, uh, a governor has some flexibility and discretion about whether or not, it, whether or not to fund it. Um, last week, um, some of us attended the Committee for Montgomery Legislative br um, Breakfast on Friday, and the governor-elect was the guest speaker, and um, Delegate Kaiser was there, so she, she can share her own impression. My impression was um, he was sending a pretty um, dire message about not putting that in and, um, and recognizing who voted for him and who did not vote for him in the election, and unfortunately, there is somewhat of an alignment between who are the biggest beneficiaries of um, the geographic cost of education index and um, uh, who voted for the, the governor-elect, uh, I think that would be a huge mistake for him to come into office and sort of as his you know, first, how do you do to the people of the state of Maryland releasing a budget two days after he's sworn in is he decides he's going to balance the budget on the backs of young people who certainly none of them voted for him or his opponent, um, and, uh, and, and whose education and investment in the future are probably the most important thing we can do for the economic vitality of the state moving forward. So hopefully he will not touch GCI. School construction is another item that um, I'm sure he will, he will look at. Um, I am uh, quite hopeful as a representative of Montgomery County, um, and I think this, this model plays out through the rest of the state, as someone who was in the real estate development business, the quality of schools and new schools are so tied to housing values and desire, desirability of neighborhoods that for him to lead the state to abandon its commitment to um, school construction funding would be, um, I, I guess, in a way, penny wise, pound foolish, because it would have an impact, a direct impact on the industry that he has spent his career in um, and would not only, I think, damage the economic vitality of many of our communities in our state, it would, it would definitely um, be a, a drag on the housing market just when, in many parts of the state, the housing market has finally rebounded um, and is uh, uh, starting to um, drive some of the activity in our local economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And following on uh, what the two senators said, uh, uh, not much to add, but at this point to say that I think when it comes to the education funding issues, the idea is that some of those cuts would be seemingly easy, but in, in many ways, as, as was just described, not so easy with a lot of implications. And what I mean is to say the idea of like flat funding education. That would be a popular thing to do at a time when there's a hole in the budget and cuts to be made 
and to say, let's look at education, and we could take some of these formulas that have already been discussed and say, let's not do the geographic cost of education index, um, and let's, let's flat fund. And when I think to my own county, in Montgomery County, to think that the Thornton formula has um, added pieces for the special population, English la language learners, special ed, farm students, and so forth, is that our population of those subpopulations keep growing. So the idea of flat funding in a situation like that, which is probably true for a lot of other jurisdictions, means that we will have less. And so I think that's very important for all of us to get together and advocate from our, from our seats in the legislature and from our different organizations to point out that flat funding means that each student in the following school year will be receiving less. And so it's a very important point. And then, um, Really, so much has already been said by my, uh, my sen uh, two senators to my left, so I'll, I'll pass. Good morning. Uh, it's hard to add a lot to what's already been said. I, uh, I would totally agree. I think uh, you're going to see some pretty significant reductions in the school construction portion of the budget uh, as it gets introduced. And uh, really, if you look over the last uh, eight plus years, uh, at education funding, the, um, it's been the real driver in our budget. And what I mean by that is everything else has taken a hit, uh, perhaps with the exception of higher education, uh, to continue funding robustly our education system. We held it somewhat sac sacrosanct. Um, we were able, as uh, the senators have mentioned, we were able to fund GCEI. Uh, I think that could be, frankly, one of the first casualties. And uh, you know, if the governor-elect is true to his word, and he's indicated several times that he intends to pursue uh, the promises that he made during the campaign, then I don't see any way possible that you're going to be able to fully fund GCEI. <laughs> Uh, that, to me, would be one of the first uh, items that gets rolled back because it is not required. It's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not a requirement in the formula funding. So uh, that would be my prediction. I think the other thing to watch is going to be the uh, dynamic of the counties. And we began to run into this issue as we continue to robustly fund education during the uh, uh, the Great Recession years from 2007 to 2011, 2012 in pr particular, what we found were the counties were uh, pulling back on their funding for education. And how do we maintain the state constitutional requirement that we provide an adequate uh, education to every student in the state, whether you're in County A or Counties B, uh, in terms of the wealth in those jurisdictions, how do you maintain equality? And it's difficult when the state formula is trying to drive some equities, but the counties are funding at a much different level, in particular the maintenance of effort. Uh, maintenance of effort, uh, as most of you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be keeping up uh, when the state's providing some real robust funding. So. Uh, with that, I would just say, you know, those would be the two that, in particular, that I would watch for as uh, you move forward and the new budget gets introduced by uh, the new governor. The, the panel just before this uh, basically said, well, we need to, you know, continue to fund uh, the, the Thornton Aid to Education um, by the way, as we were going through this, for, for those of us, those of you watching, uh, there's a little book. I'm never sure how many people actually read this. It's called Issue Papers, 2015 Legislative Session. Uh, the, the people at the Department of Legislative Services put it together, and uh, the, the section on education, which goes for about 20 pages, is actually a good summary of, of all the issues that we're we're going to discuss on this panel today, um, both from a funding perspective and a policy perspective. But the what, 
one of the real questions is given that that most of the the legislators on this panel are basically going to support continue funding for for Thornton but if you're trying to balance the budget and you've taken tax increases off the table and you say you're not going to do any of the, the, the budget gimmicks that have been done, in other words, taking the money out of the open space funding and things like that, where else in the budget are you going to look for, for savings if you're going to try to find savings? Uh, I mean, I, I know it's not education related, but it is related to education because uh, if you're trying to if you're trying to balance the budget, and and maybe we'll start with uh, Senator Manolino on on, on this, uh, <laughs> the the incoming vice chair of budget and taxation. Sure. Um, and I just want to uh, also remind everyone because um, Delegate Bohannon talked a little bit about maintenance of efforts. And um, uh, and remind people that in the 19 in the early 1990s, when um, Bobby Neal, who was a senator, a delegate, and at that point was the county executive of Anne Arundel County, and I'm sure Delegate Curry or Senator Curry remembers this as a member of the House. Delegate Gutierrez remembers this as a member of the Board of Education. Senator Pinsky remembers this. <laughs> um, that um, Bobby um, Bobby Neal pushed for something that became known as the Neal Amendment, would actually which actually for two years um, exempted everybody from actually meeting maintenance of effort. So it gave all of the, uh, the local governments a two-year pass on maintenance of effort. Um, he's now the governor-elect's chief um, policy advisor, so hopefully, or budget advisor. Hopefully he's not gonna be advocating for that again, but I think that's another piece of the dynamic that we have to look out for. And when the budget, and something that we all know down here is the BRFA, the Budget Reconciliation and Financing Act comes out. Um, we're going to have to scour that. I'm sure the people from MCEA will be scouring that for those sorts of items that could be buried in there as part of the budget um, pr proposal um, to, to, to benefit um, the, some of the, the local governments. As far as the budget cuts go, um, you know, that's not necessarily an easy, it's not an easy task, but I would point out that um, we are often our own worst enemy when we put out some of these projections because they are planned spending versus assumed revenues. So you're, 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 you're assuming that you're gonna spend all of this money, that everything is gonna grow in a specific way, that um, there are going to be uh, salary increases for everybody and merit increases for everybody and health insurance is gonna continue to grow that way and energy costs are gonna grow that way. And who knows what the economy is going to look like in 18 months. So um, he can make some, um, some rather substantial changes to that pattern by just not going along with some of the planned increases that are in the budget. And um, I have argued with prior administrations that cutting planned spending isn't actually a reduction but I'm sure in the, in the conversation that we will move forward, cutting planned spending is going to be trumpeted as an enormous <laughs> um, sacrifice uh, that, that uh, he, he is being um, both um, conservative and, and prudent. I would, I would hope that the conversation goes to nothing more than how do we cut the budget to balance it? My fear is I don't think we should be cutting education and cutting off our children's future to lower taxes, when in fact we already have um, a modest tax burden in the state of Maryland. We just happen to do it through the income tax. But um, there are going to be two different debates coming up, potentially this year and over the next four years. Are you just cutting the budget to balance the budget, or are you cutting the budget to cut taxes and taking money away from the progress we've made and helping out the Baltimore City school system, helping out the Prince George's County school system. We shouldn't be cutting services to those young people and cutting off their opportunity for the future in, um, as a way to pay off tax cuts for the wealthiest amongst us. And hopefully that is not what the next few years is going to be about. Senator Pinsky has a, has yeah. a comment to make. I also think we have to address the issue, excuse me, I'm coming off of a cold. I think we have to address the issue of tax expenditures. 
I know we're hearing we have to cut, we have to cut, we have to cut. Uh, unfortunately, for example, last year, and with all due respect, I think the legislature passed a foolhardy um, uh, issue called the uh, cut to the estate tax. Um, I'm not sure why it was done. I voted against it. Be that as it may, if we freeze that cut and don't continue with the phase-in of the estate tax, we can save $249 million over the next four years. So we don't have to reverse it and go backwards. But if we freeze it and don't continue with the phase-in of the estate tax, which essentially uh, favor 3% of the population, 3% of the population, if we freeze it at this point and say, you know what, maybe in hindsight it wasn't so great, we have a shortfall in our economy, we have to uh, uh, fund education, maybe we should just hold it at that. So I, I think we shouldn't just limit the conversation to what we're going to cut because there are only so many crumbs. So the question is, whose ox gets scored? Uh, mixing metaphors here. Um, sorry. Uh, and, and, and there are other issues as well, which some people don't call um, uh, reversing taxes. It's closing loopholes. So we think there are plenty of opportunities that we can save revenue, uh, fully fund education, and not harm those people in the safety net. because. When you look at the budget, and again, I'm not an expert, I have other experts here, um, between education and uh, health care and other, some other safety net issues, that's an overwhelming majority of the budget. So uh, if we have to uh, reverse this uh, tax benefit to 3% to maintain the budget, not improve the budget, maintain the budget uh, as it is, I think that also should be uh, part of the conversation. You want to weigh in on this? Uh, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> John? No. Uh, okay, so uh, what about maintenance of uh, effort? That's really a, that's really a policy uh, issue. There, there's been significant, well, there are people who say there would be there's been significant expansion of the requirements <laughs> on the counties, and since Senator Madalino brought it up, that uh, former Senator Bob Neal had proposed that. Uh, uh, I was not aware of that, but that certainly sounds like something that uh, they would extend to the counties as a way of perhaps reducing other kinds of aid. So uh, it doesn't cost the state any money to say, well, we'll give you this break, uh, but it's something that would have to pass the legislature, correct? And, and which committees would that fall under? The, the maintenance of effort uh, requirements for the counties. Previously, it was, I, I believe it was jointly assigned on our side between Ways and Means and Appropriations with, with Ways and Means as uh, first the primary, and then it was on the Budget and Tax Committee. Uh, to, to go beyond that, uh, the, the classic debate in, in education funding is the idea of supplement versus supplant. And from the state's perspective, to fund, to help local jurisdictions fund their education, and then to simply have those local jurisdictions take that money and then move their own funding elsewhere kind of violates the whole premise of state funding uh, of education. And from the perspective of my county, which, hasn't, which not all of our council members have been happy with this law over the last few years, I have to remind them that since this law came into play uh, in, in the early 80s uh, with fine tuning along the way, that it has been a benefit to our counties and other wealthier counties to say that that money that we're sending to the state that then goes to fund other counties' educations is a good thing and that it's helping all kids around the state get that the opportunity that they deserve to succeed. Not equal, um, not equal results, but equal opportunity. And to remind people that that's the idea behind it. When that money goes there, they should be maintaining their own education funding. And so I think Again, that goes back to our, the state role and what we should be doing to, to help uh, the local jurisdictions. And, and again, it goes back to being on the backs of the kids to say that that would be the cut that we would allow a blanket waiver to the local jurisdictions so they could cut their own money. Um, again, 
we're, we've been number one in this uh, nation for five straight years in education. And a lot of that has to do with our uh, strong funding and ensuring that high quality teachers are, are in as many classrooms as, as we can get them into. The other thing I would just add, and uh, the other two gentlemen here who uh, also did a lot of work on the maintenance of effort legislation, a lot of the uh, criticisms we received over the last few years is that we made uh, the bill less flexible, when in fact, we made it more flexible. We, ma we made positive changes to maintenance of effort. We made it easier to get the waiver. Uh, we added in a piece that I believe came from Delegate Gazzoni in terms of how we were dealing with those with higher uh, levels of effort would have an e easier opportunity to reduce by one, two, or three percent their maintenance of effort under certain circumstances. And I believe he came up with that formula. And what we are really proud to do, which really came by the speaker's idea, was what are we doing about low effort counties? You could be a county every year meeting maintenance of effort. Inflation goes up, you're still paying that same amount per student, and, some, and we're saying that's okay? That's what maintenance of effort is? No, when we put a provision in the bill that's been much ignored because the economy hasn't gotten better yet, but near the end of the, the legislation was a piece to say that when the economy gets better, you low effort counties have to increase your investments in education. Because again, if you're expecting the state to help you, you need to do more for yourself when times are good. So, With, with a number of counties facing deficits this year, are we in a situation where they could request uh, waivers? John? I, I mean, I think you're going to see growing uh, disparities, growing pressures from the local jurisdictions uh, to avoid trying to keep up with state funding for education. One of the problems that we have, Maryland is pretty unique in the sense that the Constitution requires equality across the state for education funding. And it's difficult to do that when you have some counties who haven't wanted to fund education as robustly as the state has done since the implementation of Thornton. That's really what we've run into uh, since the adoption of Thornton. And if you look in today's Washington Post, there's a story about uh, the, what is it, the Virginia, I mean the Commonwealth Institute did a uh, report talking about the poor schools in the state have borne uh, the brunt of fiscal decline in funding for education in Virginia and in many states across the country. Education funding has been slashed pretty significantly since 2008 as uh, revenues have declined. What that has caused in Virginia is a great disparity. And they said that the poorer jurisdictions have lost three times as much funding for education as the wealthier jurisdictions. All right, in Maryland, we try to keep that in balance, in check. And uh, we do that through maintenance of effort and through some other mechanisms. But the problem is, as that disparity grows, ultimately it costs the state more money because the state for funding formula says you've got to keep some balance. Whether you're in Montgomery or Howard County or name two of the poor jurisdictions in the state, it doesn't matter. You're entitled to the same level of education in theory. That gets very expensive when that gap continues to widen. And you have counties, and, and we've used this argument many times, 11 of the 24 jurisdictions lowered their taxes during the last eight years. Uh, they wanted to give folks a tax break, and that's great, good for them, but that cost them, they're some of the same ones who said, we can no longer afford to keep up. We're asking for relief on maintenance of effort. And at the state level, we've gone in the opposite direction. We've increased taxes in order to do one thing, and that is fund education. That's a growing disparity that I don't know how you're going to address it going forward. Uh, I'll leave my good colleagues to continue the good work on that. But uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a real issue here in the state of Maryland. And again, we're somewhat unique in the sense that uh, the Constitution requires us to keep it balanced. No matter which of the 24 jurisdictions uh, a child grows up in, he or she is entitled to the same, constitutionally entitled to the same level of, uh, uh, approximately the same level of education. One of the points that Delegate Kaiser made in her presentation about the changes that we made in the law um, two years ago uh, is, is very important. The idea that we provided um, a more robust 
system for the school systems, the local governments, and the State Department of Education and the State School Board to come together to work towards a county, a system by system, a county by county solution to these problems. Um, the, the, the old law, um, unfortunately, didn't have, I think, these sorts of years <laughs> and economic circumstances um, uh, assumed within it. But now, you can come in and if a county is having a, a specific problem because of the, of the economic condition, uh, of their economic condition, they can come in and come up with a multi-year solution to their, to their problem, but they can do it by negotiating um, between themselves and the state and the rest of the, the stakeholders within the school system to come to a solution as opposed to a, um, the, the, um, the, the prior system, which I'm trying to think, which is a, what is a sledgehammer approach to, um, to, to, to undoing maintenance of effort, like a legislative action that just exempts everyone from maintenance of effort, or the old system, which just said you could come in, ask for a waiver, but then next year, of course, things will go back to normal, and you're supposed to go up to that, that new funding level. So it's a much smarter law, thanks to Delegate Kaiser and Delegate Bohannon, um, that we have uh, moving forward. So it should be one that if a school system wants to use it, they should do it. However, when you look at the commitment to education, I mean, we called um, in 2002 when the General Assembly passed the Thornton formulas, it's the bridge to excellence. We have crossed the bridge and found excellence. Delegate Kaiser said for five years, we've been the number one school system. If you want to dismiss the Ed Week rankings, I think there is a consensus. We are a top five public system um, in, the, in the state, in, in the country. We have delivered. You have delivered with that promise to our young people. We have very little else um, as a basis for economic growth in the future besides our human resources. We're not sitting on oil. We're not sitting on other resources. You can only, you know, the Chesapeake Bay is fabulous, but you're not going to grow the economy on crabs and oysters. You're going to grow the economy on the skill of the people that live here. When you look at the countries around the world that we are competing with, they're not high resource countries, they're high intelligence countries. And this is an investment in those young people who will never have a second chance. I mean, when I look at my own kids, they're hopefully not going to be doing sixth grade and second grade again. This is their one chance <laughs> at, at, at doing that, those grades and developing those skills. They should not pay a penalty for their lifetime because we didn't have the right resources to invest in them during this downturn in 2014. We have to find a way to make the sacrifices to keep that commitment up. And if you have that conversation with the people of the state, I think nine out of 10, eight out of 10 Marylanders are going to say that is a worthwhile investment and I will continue to pay for that investment because of how important it is for my children, my neighbor's children, grandchildren, and for our future. What, what about health care? The, the other fast growing area of the bu budget and growing, as a matter of fact, faster than education has been health care. And as we go, uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, increased eligibility for, for Medicaid, but we're now coming to the point where the state is going to have to pick up more of the funding in the, in, in, in the out years. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to present the situation that it's, uh, you know, if, if you want, if you take tax increases off the table, that it's a zero-sum game, that uh, uh, you, you, you can't continue, increase the funding. The, the current estimate is that funding for education aid would go up about $180 million dollars. Uh, uh, next year. Are, are there areas like health care where we've also increased taxes uh, on tobacco, alcohol, allegedly to increase health care spending? Uh, uh, is, that, is that an area that we have to take a look at 
for pullbacks in, in order to continue funding education? Well, I, for one, am going to be introducing legislation to actually increase the cigarette tax by a dollar a pack to dedicate that $100 million for health care um, in the state to try to keep up with that demand and to um, continue to push down tobacco use. It's been a huge success. Our public policy effort in raising the tobacco tax and driving down smoking has been a huge success um, since the Glendenning administration. Now, I would say from a health care front, one of the, my favorite briefings of the Ehrlich era, and Delegate Bohannon and I were both in appropriations, when their Secretary of Health came in, Nelson Sabatini, and he talked about cost shifting. And the idea that if we pushed people off of Medicaid, those people would not have insurance, they're still going to get sick, they're going to be uncompensated care, um, that's going to be built into everyone's insurance costs, so your taxes will go down, but your health insurance will go up, but probably the one group that's despised more than government is health insurance. <laughs> so, so that you're going to wind up at being angry with the insurance companies, but the insurance companies exist sort of in this <laughs> never world of, of misunderstanding by the public, so they get angry at them, you don't vote for your insurance company. So I think we have created, in fact, a more cost-efficient system through Obamacare by providing more people with access to insurance and actually um, reducing the amount of uncompensated care which we all pay for. I mean, it's not, if we don't provide people health care, it doesn't mean magically they're not sick. They, they still will turn to the system and there's still a price to pay for that this is the, probably the most cost-efficient manner to pay. Um, I think there are, there are ways, and I look forward to, as Anne, Anne reminded me, I'm going to be chairing the Subcommittee on Health and Human Resources um, during the next term, and I, there, are, there are ways that I'm sure we are going to push the, the health department to be more efficient. We have fallen down on some of the technological um, infrastructure projects that were supposed to be done that are going to be costly and unless we can get our, our handle on getting those fixed it's going to continue to drain money and if the new administration was serious about um, health care and improving um, the, the health outcomes probably finding a really talented manager to come into DHMH the health department and take control of that of that entity would be probably the, the biggest single contribution they can make to um, reducing costs is getting control of that agency and disciplining really the contractors who have failed us over and over on our health IT, which is unfortunately putting us in a situation where we are, we are um, losing money um, uh, and tax dollars because we are unable to gain a better control over who we're covering and what we're paying for. We want to move on to the policy area, but we haven't, but, but, but we haven't uh, fully dealt with the, the school construction issue in the context of the, the capital budget and, and the debt service. I mean, is that, uh, is that an area where uh, cuts really have to be made just on the basis that, that the the debt service has has grown so high, uh, and, and <clears throat> as you know, this is something that the, the legislative analysts have been pushing uh, on the on the debt service. I mean, is is that an area, particularly with uh, Montgomery County, has a lot of a lot of needs? There is a feeling that Baltimore City, uh, you know, has this billion dollar commitment for for its very old schools and replacing them or renovating them. Uh, what's, going to, what's going to happen on the school construction area since it's not part of the operating budget? Do, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, uh, I think we're back on the same conversation. It's a matter of priorities and, and what the governor generates in his budget. So uh, I'm not sure you're going to get many different answers from what we've talked about so far. So I sort of would acquiesce to moving on to some education yeah, policy. So, yeah, I would just point out, you know, B.B. Verdery from ACLU, who championed the Baltimore City plan, that's a billion-dollar commitment that does not cost the state a dollar in debt capacity, 
we came up with innovative solutions. Hopefully, moving forward, we will come up with innovative solutions and the plan we put on the table for Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Baltimore County, which is patterned after the Baltimore City deal, gets real money out the door to fix capacity issues and the needs of those counties without adding to the debt capacity of the state. Um, it's that sort of, I think, innovative thinking we have to move forward to to help meet our needs and recognizing the political and fiscal realities of the state. Let me just add very quickly, again, the growing disparity in the wealth among the 24 jurisdictions creates some issues here. Uh, there are school systems now where we're paying, I think we're at 96 and now we're at 98, 99 percent of the state is paying for the cost of school construction in those jurisdictions. Um, we can't continue to fund at that level. Maryland is one of only, it's a single digit number, I forget how many states, that provides funding for school construction at all. Most states don't do it. Renee, how many? Five? About five, uh, four or five other states do that. Uh, this is going to be a subject of serious d discussion. Uh, frankly, we knew that during the, uh, during the recessionary years, we purposefully invested heavily in capital investment. Why did we do that? Because we were getting a great bargain for taxpayers at the time. Interest rates were down pretty low, and the competition was almost non-existent, and we got some really good bargains for the investment that we made, and we made record amounts of investment, particularly in public school construction. Are we going to be able to continue at that level, at that pace? I don't think so. I, I think you're going to see a serious uh, reset in that, uh, in, in that area. And the governor, I think, is going to be... Uh, committed to doing that. There, there are a lot of concerns about the uh, uh, debt service costs and uh, the impact that that has ultimately on property taxes. And so I think for that reason, you're going to see a significant reset in what we've been doing for public school <coughs> construction. On, <clears throat> on my list of questions is charter schools, and we actually have two questions uh, from the audience about uh, charter schools. One asking, do you see any changes to uh, Maryland's charter school laws and the other, whether they will be uh, held to uh, higher standards. The context is the majority of charter schools uh, in Maryland are in uh, Baltimore City. Uh, uh, a number of jurisdictions don't have any. Uh, some of the larger uh, jurisdictions have have very few. Uh, let's start with Senator Pinsky on that in terms of uh, in terms of charter schools. Do you see much change in the policy area there? Uh, charter schools, the requirement of the law is that charter schools uh, get funded the same way as uh, uh, as regular public schools and they and they are public schools and uh, but do you see any changes there? If there were some suggestions that made sense, I think our committee would look at those. Um, we are open to those schools giving the students opportunities to be successful. Um, if they have best practices at work, I think we clearly should have uh, LEAs adopt them and consider them. If they work, there's no reason why um, that we can't consider them for whole school systems. You know, I. I th we have, I think, 47 operating now and 11 have closed. Um, a, a recent study just came out in the last 10 days or eight days, although unfortunately I think it's incomplete because it doesn't analyze some of the areas that we need to look at before we go forward. Uh, one question is why those 11 closed and did they close in a timely fashion? Because one of the concerns with, um, with charter schools is someone creates a school and it goes on for two years, four years, five years, or six years, and if the students continue to lag and continue to lag, and then those people walk away and the school closes, those students fall back to the traditional public school system. And that means the public school system has to make up for the, the shortcomings and the failures. And 
you know, I've talked to Dr. Alonzo, and, and they closed, uh, most of the closing came from Baltimore City. And the oversight is a, is a fundamental question, and I think that goes, that, that doesn't get much print in, in the recent study. Um, the what, stud what study, uh, um, what's a study? The legislature um, passed legislation two years ago for a complete study of charter schools, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, the demographics, the numbers. Uh, one of the outcomes showed that for fourth grade, the uh, results using state tests, um, the uh, scores for charter school, uh, students versus other traditional students were very comparable, very little difference. At middle school, the charter schools showed an improvement. As I looked at the numbers, however, across the state, and you're absolutely right, Len, that two out of every three are in Baltimore City, and if you include Prince George's County, three out of every four are where there's concentration of poverty. You know, they haven't taken off in the other 22 jurisdictions. There are a couple in Anne Arundel, a couple in Frederick, but essentially, it's where there's concentration of poverty. And schools have had difficulties recruiting teachers, uh, principals, and having other challenges. So if, if the market speaks in the other 22 jurisdictions, it hasn't spoken very loudly. <laughs> now, some would say it's because it's very difficult for uh, charter schools to open. They do not get money for bricks and mortar. That's absolutely true, and some people say it's a concern. But as a legislature, we had to decide if someone wanted to open a charter school and ask for money for bricks and mortar, and then two years later they walked away, who holds the liability for those schools? Well, the state does. So we decided not to, not to give that authority for the bricks and mortar, only for operating. Now, I spoke with some charter schools uh, about a month ago, and they said, look, we've been in operation five years, 10 years. We've had good results. We're here to stay. Well, you know, that's an interesting point. But I think we have to do a very thorough study. And the other point I'd say about charter schools, if you look across the state, a lot of people say it's about race, and it is about race, but it's also about wealth and class. And in some of the jurisdictions, the percentage of students who are on farms, free and reduced meals, is lower than the traditional students. And I think we've seen in many places the parents of those children who know how to work through the bureaucracy and may have some historic background in education themselves, having achieved a high school or a college degree or some college, uh, are more likely to, to enter uh, many of the charter schools. And, but where the poorest of the poor, they're generally still attending the traditional schools. And I think we have to look at that. And, and I would say, if there are charter schools where they have a comparable number of farm students and they are showing true success and exceeding the results of the traditional schools, we need to look at them and what they're doing right and see whether those lessons can be uh, shared with the rest of the schools in the jurisdiction. However, if you have a school where they either have a comparable number of farms and are lagging, how long should they lag before we say, you know what, this is a mistake and it's going to end up on, on, on ourselves? Or if um, they have, uh, uh, well, let me just stop there. So, Here's, we, we didn't want to filibuster from the Senate side. Uh, delegate, oh. de no, oh. Oh. <laughs> that's the shortest speech he's given in five years. <laughs> <laughs> we in fact don't have the filibuster in the House of Delegates, but I'm hoping my notes here don't mean I'll take longer than uh, the senator. Uh, in terms of charter schools, I think it's how we how we look at things. Uh, philosophically and for me what charter schools provide is that experiment it provides the, those alternatives we know that not all children learn the same way and charter schools provide us an amazing model to test something new try something new something for for a given population and I think it gives us a chance for best practices and to say maybe that's something we can do in other schools but I think what sometimes get, gets lost in the conversations about charter schools is ensuring that we do have the same accountability, that we do have the same tests for students, that we do have the same uh, rights uh, in terms of collective bargaining for teachers. 
Uh, the, the last point I, I, I would end on in regards to charter schools, so maybe my answer is brief after all, is the idea that if we're going to make that investment, not just the monetary investment, but that psychological investment, that commitment to a community, to a neighborhood, to whomever is going to that charter school, that if we're going to say, we're going to give you a shot, that we have to give them a real shot, that the principals and teachers in those schools need to believe in the mission as well, because otherwise we are setting them up for failure. So we don't want the principal in that given charter school to cherry pick the best teachers out of a given uh, jurisdiction, but at the same time, they shouldn't be getting teachers who don't believe in their individual mission. And I was having that conversation uh, recently with Sean at M MSEA and saying, I'm not sure what that balance is and how we write the law the exact right way. How do we ensure that they get people who believe in their mission, but not necessarily taking the best teachers from all the other schools? And, and that's something I look forward to working on. Uh, moving on to probably one of the most controversial topics in the last couple of years, uh, Common Core. Uh, there are certainly new members of the legislature uh, on the Republican side who ran on the platform of repealing Common Core, which is probably fairly unlikely. But uh, do you see the legislature weighing in at all on any changes about Common Core? Uh, Common Core, the uh, the curriculum uh, standards, that is the outcomes and goals, and, and frankly, I forget the, the five word name that Maryland is now calling Common Core. Thank you. Uh, do, do you see the legislature weighing in at all, uh, except? on the periphery where it weighed in in terms of using the common core evaluation test for teacher evaluations and things like that, but uh, the legislature didn't essentially do anything to de delay its implementation. I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> remind Ray, me, Rachel. Famous last words in the Senate. <laughs> He's been around for a number of years. <laughs> Yeah, I don't expect any change in the uh, trying to abridge the um, college and career standards. And again, it's not a curriculum. It's a standard. It's, it's outcomes. And, you know, around the country when people, critics, have been asked what should be done differently, what should the standards say, which ones would you take out, usually there's a very long silence because no one has a specific uh, problem with a standard of whether kids should know geometry or understand how government works or whatever it might be. And the, I think the important point with the standards is it's more to the why than the what. It's, it's, it's deeper. And, and I think the pushback, at least in Maryland, has been in the implementation and the time to learn it and understand it and implement it, not with the substance. You know, it, I've talked to teachers in numbers of counties and when they have time to do it and practice it, they say it makes sense. And it's a good learning strategy and tool. But in terms of the substance, I just haven't heard much objection. So I don't think it'll have legs to, to reverse it. I think the, the park test, the assessment that goes with it, in the implementation, we've already postponed using it for two years. It's a different wrinkle. And I don't know if you want to talk about that separately or, or not, but I'll stop. Well, you can. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, anytime you put in a new assessment, it raises lots of questions. It, it takes a few years to norm, to get the right numbers of what is success, and for a student to get used to taking it. You know, we've had a situation, we had one year where the old MSA test was being used, but people weren't being assessed on it. So a transition is very difficult. And, and the previous panel talked about the technology problem, because the park tests are designed to be taken entirely on computer, and, and uh, not all schools are equipped in the same way to handle it, and they don't want any computers that they have to be taken out of classroom use just so people can be tested on it. So Right, and, and part of the reason for having it online is to get quicker results to change practice, to see where students are falling down or teachers need to change their practice. So that makes all the sense in the world. You don't want to give results six months later. Um, but whether it takes two years or three years or four years, I think the jury's still out, and I think it will be around the country until we get those results and how students uh, adapt to it. 
So I think schools are still going to have to decide what assessments to use, which raises a bigger question, which again, we can, we can hold, Len, is how much time is being spent on tests. So, but I'll, let me stop with that. The common, to me, the Common Core is a, a, a basic framework to create a series of standards and goals for our students so they will be able to compete with the best young people from around the world. That's why Democrats and Republican governors from around the country came together to move forward with this. If some of my colleagues want to advocate for having our children prepared less than the best students around the world, I would en encourage them to argue that point moving forward because we should be demanding that our students are getting the best opportunities and the best, the best um, and have the best standards to compete with the best um, young people from around the world. The issue I think we will actually spend hopefully more time on is testing. We are continuing to be the one lone major country that uses these tests not to gauge students and their performance, but to gauge teachers and their performance, which is I think the wrong direction and the wrong message. We should be using good, well, <laughs> we should be using good tests in order to assess how our students are moving forward and if they aren't, what services they need in order to move forward and not as a punitive system to punish teachers. So um, I think if we can get testing right, and I think PARC is a good, a good model moving forward, but as long as it's used to inform teachers, administrators, how to help those students move forward, then we will be prepared, I think, to have an even stronger system. As a parent with two kids in the school system, I'm worried about them spending time on tests that aren't improving them. Um, so if you're gonna spend time on tests, and I've spent more time doing homework and tests than I thought I would, um, during the last few months as we transition to middle school. Um, I, I do think I want to see that investment go towards improving her and her outcomes as opposed to making it about um, penalizing her teachers or um, her school. Do you want to weigh in? No. No, okay, okay. Good. Don? Uh, uh, very quickly add this. One of the things that folks rail often against is the preparedness of our students uh, when they go to college. Uh, you know, remediation rates are up in the community colleges, in, in some cases, uh, in the 70, 80 percent range. How do we fix that? Well, this is one of the one of the options for addressing that kind of situation. Um, you know, you got to pick and choose. You can't be against. You can't rail against the remediation rates and say our kids just aren't ready for college. What's happening? And this this is failing, and then say, well, we don't like any of the efforts to try to improve that. Uh, you've got to come up with some alternatives. Are they the, the right answers? I don't know. I mean, you know, these things take a while, as Senator Pinsky said. Uh, it's difficult. But I can tell you this. Folks came together across the country, as Senator Maddalino said, and have tried to put a lot of effort. This is not government driven. This is ultimately driven by the private sector and governors who came together and said, let's figure out how to do this. And in some cases, uh, like the archdiocese uh, around the state for the Catholic uh, Church, have adopted this. For one reason, cost. It's a cost driver. You know, it's a much cheaper way to proceed with their education system, and that's been a driver, and also the, uh, you know, ultimately it is to make the nation uh, more competitive, and, you know, we sit back year after year. I remember a few years ago, the U.S. is ranked 12th. I think we're now lower than that in terms of college graduates as a percentage of our uh, population. Other countries around the world are passing us by, and we've got to maintain competitiveness. And if you've got some better alternatives, then come in with them. But uh, at this point, you know, it's, it, we're going to continue. As Senator Pinsky said, change is very difficult, and you're seeing that in action right now. Uh, maybe there's a better way, but uh, you've got to come up with some better alternatives rather than just being against everything. And the park tests, if they work the way they're supposed to, 
teachers are supposedly going to be able to see the performance of individual students and the problems with the problem with the the Maryland school assessment in the past was that that the, the scores were delayed for a long period of time and you had kind of a bulk assessment of a class as opposed to uh, as Senator Maddalena was saying, helping the individual students, seeing where where the, uh, the individual student was was falling in that category. Uh, uh, two things that will come up, and I'm going to ask them in terms of the school starting before or after Labor Day and high school start times to say, does the legislature have any role in this at all? What are typically local local issues? Many people ask us to have that role, uh, but I, I think that these really are issues of of, of local control and um, that dividing line between where the state uh, interjects in policy and where we say it's local control is not always an easy line to divide. But and and so I can't always explain why something falls on, on one side or the other, but to me, these very much are local issues and we should leave them to the 24 jurisdictions. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wanna agree with, with my colleague, and that's about the process. But it's substance, this is ridiculous. It is simply ridiculous. You know, there's a bumper sticker that says, people before profit. Well, it ought to be kids before profit. You know, to, 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 pass, a, to pass a state policy to help a community, a business community, increase their profits is absurd. You know, in fact, I believe that we should be looking at year-round school. You know, we're not an agricultural community anymore. We should be looking at creative ways to engage students three months on, three weeks off, whatever it might be. Some areas have tried it very successfully. There's less of a lag time for student learning, and there's more of a continuity, and you can actually help with students over uh, the holiday breaks, whether it be the Christmas or winter break or the spring break, Easter, whatever it might be. I don't want to get into how we're going to designate this holidays. But, <laughs> but, but to adopt the policy so people can still either attend the uh, summer vacation or be able to work there and try to foist that on the state of Maryland, I think it is shameful. And I think we ought to reject that as strongly as we can and tell people you know, let's put kids first, not your small, narrow economic well-being for one community. So I think besides the process, which I agree, I think uh, substantially it is embarrassing. And if people are unclear where I stand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was an article in the, the uh, Capital newspaper uh, uh, probably yesterday. In any case, uh, the... Uh, the new father-daughter team in the, in the legislature, Senator Brian Simonair and his daughter, a delegate-elect, uh, Megan Simonair, will be introducing a bill to keep Christmas in the calendar. The, the odd thing is they come from Anne Arundel County, which still designates Christmas as the holiday in the cal calendar, one of the 10 counties. Uh, we ran a story from Capital News Service that Maryland Reporter did that that there are 10 counties that maintain the names of the religious holidays, and there are 14 counties. It became controversial when Montgomery County uh, did it. Uh, apparently, uh, in a number of places, the Muslim community has requested having their, their holidays listed. But So there will be legislation uh, introduced, and it's likely to come uh, before your, uh, before your committee committee, Senator Pinsky. Uh, the, the, okay, I think we know Senator Pinsky's position on keeping Christmas in the, uh, in the calendar. Um, I have a question from the audience, uh, kind of unusual, but it's uh, 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 not terribly unusual. There was a 60-minute segment that, that may generate one of those 60 minutes bills we call on the legislature uh, about mental health services, but would you support measures to increase mental health services for students in schools? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
that's a that's a hard one. Are there? <laughs> would anybody? Would anybody? Hoping, it's my understanding that um, the the lieutenant governor elect um, when when outlining what would be some of the priorities of the administration at a forum um, before the election, one of the things that he identified was um, mental health care and the, the state's, um, the, 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 the progress that we have not made on um, certainly helping people in mental health crisis, whether it's young people, older people, that we have a big deficit in Maryland about crisis services for people dealing with a mental health emergency, and we have to address that moving forward. And hopefully the administration will take that seriously and um, put um, muscle and money behind trying to improve um, the mental health outcomes um, for Marylanders. Okay. Are there any, any topics that you think are going to uh, going to come up. I mean, we've actually run through all the issues that the, uh, that the folks at Legislative Services uh, have identified. Do you, do you think in the, uh, uh, go ahead. Go, no, I mean, if you, ha if you have another topic, but I, 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 was, I wanted to revisit where we were at, at, at the beginning and perhaps a more political assessment of whether there's going to be, you know, a serious battle with the incoming governor on on the education funding. I mean, is is this where the, you know, you're going to go to the barricades on uh, on this? Well, unfortunately, we would go into that battle with one hand or maybe both hands tied behind our back, uh, as my colleagues know on the budget committees and the, a post a policy where we go into a fair conversation with uh, uh, split power among at least these two, the, the two executive and the legislature. With the budget, the governor introduces the budget and the legislature can only cut money. Now obviously there's some trading quid pro quo with, with uh, uh, second and third budgets uh, that come out, the supplemental budgets that come out, but we can only cut. So we but don't- other than GCEI, he, he, has to, he has to change the BRFA, which is a piece of legislation where you, you, you don't have the same, uh, I mean, to, in, in order to get the budget to, to balance, you have to get these changes made in the BRFA. I mean, if you want to change, maintenance of effort or, or anything in, the, in that area? Well, I think, I think um, I'll go back to something I said before that I think um, my colleagues up here would agree with. Uh, we will be on the barricades if it's cutting education funding um, to give tax cuts um, to the wealthy the most fortunate uh, around the state. Um, we have to balance the budget. We're going to work through that process with him, hopefully in a collaborative um, fashion. I think all of us through our campaigns said, priority number one, education. Um, and that means keeping that commitment because we're actually delivering on that commitment um, to young people and it's so critical for, for our success moving forward. Um, I think the, if the governor-elect is going to focus on issues around um, economic competitiveness for our state, uh, I think he will find partners in the General Assembly working on ways to diversify our, our regional economy because what do Maryland and Virginia have in common right now? Budget deficits that are being driven by congressional actions or inaction. Um, so we have to figure out a way around how we um, have a more diverse economy in order to weather those sorts of, of, of storms from the federal government. If he wants to just hammer education as a way to cut the budget and cut taxes, I think he will find very few friends in the legislature and even fewer friends outside of the legislature because I don't think that's what Marylanders voted for in, in 2014 in the election. I don't think it's very smart politically, as, as, no, as a matter be, of fact. I think, be, I think it would be very foolish for him. A Governor Ehrlich, I mean, Governor Ehrlich really went after higher education. 
I mean, we, we saw 50% tu um, tu uh, tuition rise by 50% during those four years. And I think he paid a price um, in, the, in his failure to win re-election four years later. The public supports investments in education because they understand why it's important for both young people, for their families, and for the greater economy. If Governor Hogan wants to make cutting education part of his platform, I think he will find um, the vast majority of Marylanders will not support that. Um, and, and therefore, you're right, it's not going to be politically smart moving forward for him. And he deliberately disassociated himself when it, 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 he, there was an attempt to link him with those tuition increases during the during the early years, and he said, well, I wasn't part of that, and, uh, and, and he allegedly opposed them. Two questions from the audience. I think they may be from the same person, but they relate to, to childhood poverty uh, a, as a major issue for st student school success. And also, the, uh, the, it relates to me a, to a, a topic that Governor-elect Hogan has talked about, uh, that is the achievement gap. Uh, to a great extent, education aid has been is, is spread all over. Is, is, there, is there a way that, uh, that the state has a role in changing these conditions of poverty and the achievement gap? And why don't we start with Delegate Kaiser on, on this one? Start with Senator <laughs> uh, I think uh, in terms of our you know, education funding formulas and how it's wealth-based and how we give that money to special populations, we're trying to address what the county's needs are to give them extra funding to educate those who have greater needs. Um, and I think farms, uh, more than the other added measures, are the proxy that tie in in a lot of ways or correlated strongly with the achievement gap. So I think there's already a, an, a, an attempt uh, from the state of, for those who helped develop Thornton, like Senator Madalino, even before he was a delegate being involved with uh, uh, that legislation. Uh, I think certainly there could be a role to play to look at the achievement gap as well. Unfortunately, that comes back to how are we measuring that achievement, which is the right test to be using, and then it brings us back to all of the different testing issues. So. Uh, you know, could we all agree on what's the right test to then say the achievement gap should be evaluated on to then be compensated for? So I, I, I think it would be an interesting uh, public policy conversation to have, but again, we have to straighten out some of those testing issues. There is an achievement gap. There's a wealth gap. You know, there's, a, there's significant concentration of poverty. And where there's concentration so of poverty... not demographic? Essentially, before you get before you get to the, the schools at, at all. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, if you don't have opportunity, and you have a parent who's working two jobs and not at home, there are not books in the home. There's not anyone except the older brother or sister to read to you. Um, you don't have an opportunity to be taken to a theater or a movie or to whatever. Um, you come in a few steps behind. You know, it's the idea of getting children ready, and some have more opportunity than others. I mean, it's, it's a fact. It is a class fact, and it's wealth. You know, and does the state have a role? Of course it has a role. You know, can, should we have wraparound services in school buildings for those who don't get them on their own with their family? Of course we should. Obviously, it becomes a resource question um, to be able to, to afford that and create more opportunities. It gets to jobs, it gets to housing, it gets to multiple factors. Um, some people don't want to talk about that. They want to keep it to the schoolhouse. That doesn't mean schools don't have some responsibility. But they, too, start with one hand tied partly behind their back because kids come, some kids come more prepared, some kids come less prepared when they begin school. And, but every child should have a rigorous, challenging education. There's no question about it. But the fact also re remains that we have a shortage of quality teachers and principals, and we would like to have more come into the profession. People work very hard. Uh, it's not a profession that's looked at as a, a doctor, a lawyer, or as in many other of the countries that we're ranked against. Um, 
we started the conversation by talking about how much money is being invested in education, you know, in, in terms of whether it be salary, class size, whatever those factors might be. And, and sure, if we had more resources and targeted resources and accountability, uh, we could work on closing that gap, but it's not going to be done solely in the schoolhouse, although I do believe the schools have some responsibility to do it, and some are doing it better than others, and we have to see how they're doing it. Sadly, when we talk about um, budget cuts to education, and we've identified the GCEI as the most probable place where they could, um, where the governor has flexibility to cut education, who would be damaged most by a cut to GCEI? Baltimore City, Prince George's County, Montgomery County. Um, the places that are working hard to deal with the achievement gap, and certainly when you look between the different jurisdictions, the two of the school systems that need the most assistance. So it would be interesting for, for, for him to have run at identifying the achievement gap and then turning around and taking money away from the school systems that can least afford it. On the side of, uh, on, the, on the front of fighting poverty, um, I believe um, one of the most interesting opportunities that we have right now Washington County has moved ahead with some schools, and I believe Somerset County has moved ahead with all of their school systems in participating in a very interesting federal program that allows you to provide free food to every student. If you have enough students who qualify um, within your school system, then you don't have to go through any of the farm paperwork. You don't have to create the whole system uh, of, of, of following that paperwork and billing people. You can, you can pre-qualify your entire school system. Next year, we could provide, at federal expense, free meals for every student in the Baltimore City public school system. It's just about finding and doing the hard work to figure out how we properly um, keep track of the number of poor kids in the school system that are eligible for the, the, the state aid program. But we should be able to figure that out. And I think that would, be, that would be an incredible achievement for us all to be able to say that we've come up with a plan that actually reduces administrative costs, reduces bureaucracy, and yet gives free meals for every student in our poorest schools around the state. That's something that I hope Governor-elect Hogan runs with. Um, and um, all of us are a part of making sure that we are, we are accessing every dollar we can from the federal government to provide those students who have the least in our school systems. That may be the last word because the bell is ringing for the second period and <laughs> we, uh, we all have to change uh, venue, right? Uh, Delegates on hand and Kaiser, Senators Madalino and Pinsky and Lynn, thank you all very much. Please thank our panelists. As the government relations director with MSEA, everything I just learned in the last hour and a half will, um, well, I'm not going to sleep incredibly well probably over the course of uh, the, the, that 90-day session, but uh, very informative, and thank you all for participating. We are now uh, transporting uh, everyone from this room who is pre-registered for our lunch, meaning your name tag would be tagged with a sticker, uh, over to the west uh, the Miller Room West. We have about 10 minutes to make that shift. Your lunch will be waiting for you there, and we've got a really exciting lunchtime panel talking about assessment-related uh, issues with some of the national thinkers on that topic. So I hope you're able to stay throughout the, the remainder of the day, and uh, as you depart here, you're just walking right across the, uh, the, the foyer hall into Miller West. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.